Um, so basically what we're going to talk about, or what I'm going to talk about, is an introduction to GPU computing. Uh, so the question, the point uh, that was asked earlier, that didn't work too well, did it? Um, <laughs> maybe. Let's download it. Um, uh, so I will primarily be focusing on GPU computing in the context of uh, NVIDIA GPUs, but I will try to, um, when I make certain statements, indicate whether it's true across vendors or not. So the general context that I'm going to be talking about uh, today is how do we use GPUs to accelerate science applications. Um, so uh, as Kelly said, um, there, there are cases, you know, plenty of cases, uh, examples where you do, for example, deep learning on GPUs, and I'm happy to talk about that, answer questions, but I'm probably going to be focused on traditional scientific use cases, at least in this talk, and uh, let me know if that, uh, you have other questions. Yeah, thank you. Just present. Um, so the, the context, uh, sure. Um, the the context is that we have accelerated uh, nodes that are we we would call heterogeneous nodes or accelerated nodes now. And so any modern server node that is GPU accelerated uh, has both CPUs and GPUs, and they solve different tasks. So Jack indicated that CPUs are optimized for speed, whereas GPUs are optimized for throughput. And that's exactly the right way to think about it. That the CPU should be used for the latency sensitive parts of your calculation, and the GPU should be used for the parts of your calculation that are sensitive to throughput. So on a GPU accelerated application, you don't take your entire application and put it on the GPU. GPU is not good for every task, um, but it is good for latency sensitive tasks, uh, I.O. related tasks, for example. So if you're generating output like a plot file or, or some other sort of data from your simulation or reading it in at the beginning, typically you leave that to the CPU and you identify the part of your code um, and how do I add, oh, you're still, yeah. <laughs> I can just do this slide the whole time. Um, Right, so this is the context I was explaining that we have um, the CPU and the GPU, uh, and the CPU has uh, many fewer cores, but they're each individual much uh, stronger cores that uh, are latency um, hiding, or latency, um, very low latency op uh, cores, whereas the GPU has many cores, each one of which is not that fast and really only does a few things well in particular mathematical operations, but there's a lot of them. Um, and you could hide the latency of any one operation by, by spawning massive amounts of parallelism. Um, so you, the typical workflow is that you identify the parts of your workload that are used for, can be used well in GPU and then use them. So I'll get back to that in a minute. Um, accelerated computing, which is this general uh, concept of using both CPUs and GPUs, again, targeting each one of the things that they're good at, is, I would say, perhaps the de facto um, trend now in HPC. Um, certainly there are still plenty of HPC centers that are deploying standard uh, like Intel Xeon servers, and I don't think those are going anywhere anytime soon. But certainly at, the, at DOE and, and many of the major HPC centers, you do see this trend of using both CPUs and GPUs in an accelerated computing context. And you know, as Jack said, uh, one, one argument you can make is it's coming, so you have to, be, you have to do it. And um, another way to think about it is that it's not, you know, this is a, a trend that I think is, going, is extending uh, over the long term. So it's not just Perlmutter, it's not just Summit, I think. Uh, you, you see a trend now where for the foreseeable future, there's going to be this, this heterogeneity in, in modern HPC servers. Um, and that will then be reflected in the, in the systems that uh, large centers like DOE uh, procure. So um, CUDA, as an example, um, has uh, had quite a, a remarkable growth uh, since it was developed in the mid-2000s. Um, this gives you some of the stats that we have. Um, Plen like uh, several hundred applications that have been ported to NVIDIA GPUs, um, including essentially all of the top 10 or 15 um, uh, HPC applications that are used uh, at the major centers. Um, we have uh, millions of people who download or use CUDA or some variant of it. And so this is, I think, a very broad ecosystem and it's one that um, has many different entry points into it. So I'll give you an example of some of these today um, to emphasize the point that whereas in 2007, when CUDA was first developed, there was essentially one entry point, CUDA C, um, and now you can access it from Python, from Fortran, using the C++ standard libraries. There's lots of different entry points in GPUs and that I think is reflected across all the vendors now where vendors uh, are really embracing um, portable ways to access GPUs um, and so uh, there's, there's, there's vendor specific ways that allow you to kind of max out the performance, right? get that last drop. But there are also performance portable ways uh, from both the programming languages model level and the, the performance abstraction layer with examples like Raja and Cocos to help you do that. Um, so uh, again, um, 
GPU accelerated computing is everywhere. Um, of course, I'm sure most of you or all of you know that uh, the world's number one and number two uh, supercomputers are GPU accelerated using NVIDIA GPUs. They're, these are 100 petaflop systems here at DOE. Um, most of the other major leading systems in the world are GPU ex accelerated, um, and uh, you know, like a, a large fraction of the top 500 has acceleration in some way. And in particular, um, a very large fraction of new systems on top 500 are GPU accelerated. Um, uh, NVIDIA, but also the other vendors, work very closely to ensure that all of the major um, ecosystem tools and libraries that are used in data science and, and high performance computing are available on GPUs. So that includes things like um, the deep learning frameworks like PyTorch and TensorFlow. Uh, for NVIDIA, it recently includes things like Scikit-Learn, um, Dask, we, we, things like that that are used traditional machine learning and data science applications. And of course, we work closely with uh, traditional scientific HPC developers to port their codes to GPUs as well. So if you are a user of a code more than a developer, there's a very good chance that your code already runs on GPUs well or is, you know, somebody is looking at it. NVIDIA um, has a pretty wide stake in uh, HPC generally, and this is not just uh, the big iron, right? There's, there's, uh, NVIDIA is involved in all sorts of scientific computing, but also all sorts of computing in other contexts. And so, um, of course, we are, uh, have a big investment in traditional HPC, so that uh, involves like the Tesla V100 and, and T4 GPUs, the ones that um, are kind of the top of the line server platforms that, that folks like you might use. But this also applies, um, of course, for uh, the consumer cars that I'm sure you're familiar with. NVIDIA got its start in consumer gaming and graphics. Um, and then more recently, NVIDIA has also been involved in other uh, facets of the industry, for example, edge computing. Uh, so deploying our uh, GPUs you know, for like autonomous driving or robotics, that sort of thing. And so we have one platform that is available across all of these, um, these um, platform, uh, all of these uh, various devices. And one thing that we work hard to ensure is that an application that you write that works, uh, for example, uh, here at a, D at a you know, Dewey HP Center Center can also work on one of these devices. It may not be the same performance, but it's one architecture that, that underlies all of this. Um, the, I, I mentioned these two GPUs, so I'll, I'll discuss very briefly the two uh, major GPUs, server class GPUs that NVIDIA deploys. Uh, the V100 is our current top of the line, high end data, like uh, computational science and uh, like deep learning training type GPU. So this is really our biggest, baddest card. It's a 300 watt chip. Um, has uh, thousands of cores of, uh, in it, um, including um, uh, tensor cores. So I, Jack might have mentioned this, but these are uh, specialized pieces of hardware that do essentially matrix multiplication. Um, since that's a very common piece of, of, of math in both HPC and in, in artificial intelligence, so we specifically put that in the chip. And this is a trend. So NVIDIA really invented this, um, at least in the context of scientific HPC. Um, but you also see other vendors, I think, will probably be going in this direction, where the benefits from being able to do this particular instruction very well, um, I think, are, are compelling enough that you'll see a trend in that direction, too. Um, this GPU runs at something like 7 teraflops of double precision peak math, and then like 2x that if you're doing single precision math. Um, and um, the GPU comes in either 16 gig or 32 gig variety in terms of the amount of memory on the chip. The ones on Cori GPU nodes have 16 gigs, but there's also a variety of 32. Um, and it has very high memory bandwidth. Um, that's uh, almost a terabyte a second um, on the actual RAM on the chip. Uh, conversely, T4 is our lower power, more energy efficient GPU. This is typically used in the, in the context of artificial intelligence for inference applications, right? You've trained your, your machine learning model and now you want to deploy it to actually do, do some inference um, with, your, with your trained model. So it's a lower power card, doesn't have as much um, compute power, doesn't have any double precision compute power, so it's really targeted at those AI type inference applications. Okay, so um, I hinted at this already, but coming back to this, uh, the way that you think about GPU accelerated computing is that you find the, app, the part of your application where most of the runtime is spent and target that. That part of the application may not be where all of your lines of source are. In fact, you probably are familiar that most of the lines of source in an application are, are not really related to the core part of the compute that you're doing, right? They're, they're, they're driver code or I.O. code, um, and often the actual core compute part in terms of lines of source may not be that large. It might be 5 or 10% of your code or even less. Um, so typically the way we recommend thinking about this is that you identify 
the parts of your code that take the most time in terms of like the, the wall time, the clock time, the time to solution, and accelerate those and leave the rest on the GPU. Um, this is in part for your own sanity because trying to port the entire thing is just too much work. And also because you will actually lose efficiency if you try to put the parts of your code that don't work well on GPUs on GPUs, right? Any individual GPU core is not as good as a CPU core. So you will actually slow your code down if you try to put a serial workflow on, on GPUs. So you really want to identify the, the high throughput and parallel part of your application or the parts that can be parallelized, I should say. So, um, there are generally three ways to, that we think about accelerating your applications to take advantage of GPUs on accelerated uh, nodes. Um, I would put these in, in, into these three buckets. So generally speaking, there are the use of libraries, um, the use of directive-based approaches, and then the use of lower-level programming languages. So I'll take each of these in turn. And in this direction, going from left to right, you have, um, you're going from, a, you know, in descending ease of use, so libraries are the easiest ones to use, um, and programming languages are the most, most time intensive to get involved with, but then potentially increasing flexibility and power. So you may be giving up some potential performance, you can't ta target your workload specifically to the exact thing you're trying to do if you're using libraries because there's typically a, a well-defined set of APIs. So you typically would drop down to the programming languages uh, for that. With that said, there are certain workloads where you don't want to do that, right? So um, I probably don't have to tell you that you don't want to write your own FFT, you don't want to write your own matrix multiplication, right? There are, there are workloads where the library is, in fact, the best way to do it, and you trying to write the programming language version of it is actually a bad choice, right? Or, or would take so much of your time that it's just not a good use of your time. So um, the programming languages are really there for workloads that don't easily get exposed as a typical standard library function, like a matrix multiplication or an FFT or that sort of thing. So I'll start with libraries first, uh, drop-in acceleration. Um, as I mentioned, the, the core selling point here is both ease of use and, um, and performance and quality, right? So the idea is that this is a well-defined um, implementation of a particular reference application. And again, this is not an NVIDIA-specific statement, right? R whatever platform you're on, the vendor provides almost always an, a well-optimized implementation of BLAS um, of, of, F of, of FFTW, that sort of thing. And the same statement is generally true on GPUs where um, somebody has done that work for you because they know the architecture better than you do, better than I do even. Um, so if you're, if you're familiar with a system like Cori, uh, you might be using, for example, Intel's math kernel library. Um, on uh, NVIDIA platform, we have a set of libraries uh, that do these, this, these same sorts of things. So for example, Kublas for BLAS routines, QFFT is the name of our FFT library. Um, QRAND for gen random number generation. So we have all these libraries for doing the standard sorts of operations that you do. And again, I would say for the other GPU vendors, this is the same thing where AMD has uh, versions of this library that they've announced for doing very similar sorts of things. And I, I'm sure that Intel will as well for their discrete GPUs. Um, and again, the, the main selling point here is both it doesn't take that much time to do, but you can still get very good performance because these are hand tuned for the architecture in question. Um, these are some examples of libraries. Some of them I've already mentioned, like Kublas for dense linear algebra and QSparse for sparse linear algebra. Um, QDNN is our library that we have for the types of calculations that are very common in deep learning. Um, you often maybe, you know, if you're, if you're writing your own low-level deep learning or, or AI application, you probably would need to use those. Otherwise, the deep learning frameworks implement them for you, and that's the way you want to take advantage of them. Um, and we also have uh, libraries for parallel, parallel algorithms for both for on-node compute and uh, multi-node compute. Um, so as an example of how you would do this, uh, we'll take um, a SACSP application, so AX plus Y, and I'll come back to this, this example later. Um, but what you have here is the idea that you can um, take a function that might have been called SACSP, right? So you write your own C function that does it, and then you convert that into uh, an API that we provide, Kublas SACSP in this case, that does that same thing for you. So the idea is it's gonna be a standard API that you're probably familiar with if you use such a, like a level one BLAS operation before from another vendor. Um, and the, the other step that you have to do is just make sure you're taking aware of memory management. So GPUs and CPUs have separate memory spaces. 
and you get the most performance when you use the memory space that is closest to the device. Again, that is not a, a specific statement. That is not a new statement even. If you've used the Cori KNL nodes, you're familiar with the fact that there's a high bandwidth memory and then this, the standard uh, larger memory, which is slower, right? And so that is a very common thing that is, that is by far the trend for heterogeneous computing, that there is a diverse set of memory spaces. And if you manage those memory spaces, you will get the highest performance. So you would typically allocate memory directly on the GPU, and these are the APIs you would use to do that. Uh, and then you can just link your application, uh, then just do the standard dash L with the name of the library, and that gives you the opportunity to accelerate that workload on GPUs. Um, now, this is what your CPU source code might look like before you did any GPU acceleration work. Um, you might have like a million elements, and you're performing uh, a SACSP operation on those elements. So this is your C code, and then we're going to add the bits that make this GPU accelerated code using library. Um, so the first thing we do is add the kublas prefix, which basically says, I want the version of this that comes from the NVIDIA library. Um, we have to do some you know, init initialization and teardown. Um, so this boilerplate code. We have to actually allocate the memory. Again, going back to my point that it's better to allocate the memory on the GPU. Um, and we, we tell Kublas about this, this, this array. We say, we want you to have this, uh, to know about this and be able to operate on it. And we call the SACSP and then we get it back at the end. So we're, we're transferring, the, we're allocating data on the CPU, on the GPU. We're copying data from the CPU to the GPU, uh, doing some compute and then copying it back. And this is a very common workflow and it's kind of where everyone typically starts when they're doing GPU computing. Um, and again, you do that because if you were to leave, the, if you were attempt to leave the memory on the CPU, even if it worked, you'd get very low performance because all of your data would be streaming through the interconnect between the CPU and the GPU. And that is a much lower bandwidth than the, the, ba the bandwidth available from the GPU to its own local RAM. Um, so we have uh, on the NVIDIA website a uh, page where you can go to learn about the various libraries that are available, and these are also all described in the CUDA documentation. Okay, um, the second point is directive-based programming. And so this is kind of a middle tier uh, where it's still relatively easy to do. Um, you still have to target the specific parts of your application that you want to accelerate, um, but you don't have to write low-level code targeting the specific architecture. So um, Helen will give a much deeper description of one example of, of this uh, approach for OpenMP. Um, I'm just going to you know, give you a high-level overview to give you a flavor of, of what's going on here, um, but uh, know that what I'm describing here is not the only, the only path to directive-based programming. So the example that I will use is a parallel programming uh, framework called OpenACC. So this is a performance portability uh, model for taking specific loops in your application and then accelerating them on GPUs. And so the idea is that you're finding the parts of your application where you're spending the most time, and these are typically exposed as parallel for loops, right? That's the most parallel do loops on Fortran. That's the most common use case, and then you're accelerating those on GPUs. So this is a little bit different from a library use case because now you're taking a specific workload that is specific to your application that cannot be expressed as a standard library operation and then accelerating that. So this is kind of the, the 10,000 foot view where you take your, you find, you, you divide up your application into the serial part of your code and the, and the part that can be parallelized. You put a compiler directive there and then it does something to accelerate that on GPUs. Um, and I'll get back to the details in a second. Um, this is an example um, from the Cloverleaf mini app um, uh, from AWE in the UK uh, where we demonstrated performance um, for both parallelizing uh, using OpenACC on both CPUs and GPUs. And generally what we find is that you can get very nice speed ups in both cases. So OpenACC can be used both to parallelize across threads on your CPU node, but can also be used to parallelize across threads on the GPU node. And for this particular hydrodynamics mini app, um, you can get like 10, order 10x speed up on using all the cores on the node using OpenACC. And then you see something like order 50 to 100x speed up using GPUs for that. And so, again, relative to a single core. And so um, it's, there's performance portability in the sense that you can take that and then run that um, across multiple architectures in principle. Um, OpenACC, uh, like OpenMP, uh, has a kind of patchwork of support in various places. So OpenACC is generally supported on NVIDIA GPUs. Um, Oak Ridge, for example, I believe has expressed interest in having OpenACC available on uh, Frontier. I don't know that I can give more detail than that. You'd have to ask them. Um, but 
certainly there's uh, some set of vendors and some set of architectures in which OpenACC is supported. It's not just NVIDIA GPUs. So that's the extent to which we can say it's performance portable. Uh, similarly, with an approach like OpenMP, there's going to be some set of vendors that implement the target offload implementation that we'll, we'll get to later today. Um, and then those, uh, those, in principle, at least that code could be run in both CPUs and GPUs. And that's the promise of this approach, right? That you have one source base that can run in either one, and then at compile time, the compiler generates the instructions that target each architecture for efficiency. Um, so many of the top HPC applications have either adopted or, or experimented with OpenACC, including a few of the top 10 HPC applications in terms of total time used HPC centers. Um, and for many of them, they get pretty significant speed ups using OpenACC. Um, and in particular for large code bases, this is pretty critical um, because if you have like a, a million line code uh, and you have, and it's spread over many loops, then the development burden of maintaining all of those loops can be challenging. So having a directive based approach where uh, the, the directives are ignored if the compiler doesn't know what to do with them, for example, if you're compiling for serial CPU code, is very helpful from a development um, perspective. It helps make the code easier to maintain. Um, so this is a high level example of how you would use uh, OpenACC at compile time to um, generate something like this. So you're responsible for data management, uh, as I mentioned. Generally, you, you allocate some data on the GPU or copy data from the CPU to the GPU. Then you identify your parallel part of the code. You stick a directive. This is a Fortran example. Um, bang dollar ACC parallel loop. Basically, you put that in front of a do loop, and then that says, take this do loop and accelerate it on the GPU. So the compiler does all the work of figuring out how to spread that work across the GPU cores and make it an efficient thing. Um, it is not a magic wand. If you try to use this on work that cannot be efficiently parallelized, you will not get a good result, right? And so that's either work that has some in, in, in inherent serialization, in which the case the compiler will just refuse to uh, parallelize it, or ones where the work is not uh, efficient on the GPU. So a very good example of this would be if the loop is, has a very small trip count, right? If, if you have 100 elements of work to do in this loop, that will not saturate the GPU. Uh, I mentioned that modern GPUs have thousands of cores, right? And so if you only launch 100 elements of work, you're only using a small fraction of the threading that's available on the device. So you typically want to make sure that the amount of work you have to do exposes enough parallelism that GPU can do it effectively. Because like I said, any one of those cores uh, is not a very good core, right? And so the way the GPU works effectively is by hiding latency from any one core, by having enough work to do so that at any one clock cycle, we hopefully have some bit of work to do. Um, so you really need a lot of work in your loop to make that effective. Um, this is a slightly more worked out example uh, using the, the common example in scientific HPC of doing like a smoothing calculation, in this case, Jacobi relaxation or Jacobi iteration. Um, where essentially in every loop iteration, you're looping through the two-dimensional grid and you are uh, smoothing out or averaging out the, the current index in your grid using uh, a quarter of the four neighbors in two dimensions. Um, so this is what you look get an example of a worked out example where you first copy data in at the beginning of your loop. Uh, you, you can put a directive that basically says parallelize this region of the code. In this case, ACC kernels basically says find the loops in this structured block, or in the case of Fortran, between the ACC kernels and the ACC end kernels. Parallelize that work and then uh, end your data region at the end to copy the data back to uh, CPU. And if you have questions, please feel free to ask as you go, or as I go. Um, so OpenACC uh, is available um, from PGI for free. So if you download the community edition of the PGI compiler, you can download and experiment with this on your laptop or on your workstation. And PGI is, of course, supported at the major sites. So PGI compiler is available for doing OpenACC uh, here at, uh, on the Cori GPU nodes. So again, I want to emphasize that this was just one story uh, for OpenACC. This is not the only performance portability story. But I wanted to give you a flavor of here's a, a path to accelerating your code on GPUs that does not require you to be a GPU ninja, right? It just requires you to identify parts of your workload that are, are relatively well targeted toward, towards the architecture and then uh, tell the compiler how to figure out how to do something with that. Um, and for OpenACC in particular, we have plenty of resources on the PGI website, uh, Stack Overflow. There's even a Slack team where you can join and ask questions about OpenACC. So if that isn't a thing that's appealing to you, you're certainly welcome to reach out. Uh, as I think Jack said, um, certainly here at NERSC, there's a big push to make OpenMP one of the, if not the key, like targeted performance portability approaches for Perlmutter, certainly one of the most important ones. So uh, 
in addition to the community support for something like OpenACC, there's also going to be kind of NERSC, NERSC expert and NVIDIA expert support for OpenMP. And so I think you have quite a few options for doing performance portability on GPUs. Um, is this a good time for a break? Okay. All right. So I'm going to finish with the second half of this talk. Uh, we'll take a quick break. What time should we come back?